I, I, I can tell by his body language. It's just that he says, get the f***ing turtle out the bathtub. You think so? I really do. I think they're just like, we don't have a any worlds in the movie. Let's take it away. We already had her ass crack later. Earlier. No, you keep saying that, but I'm saying, like, I think you can get away with a lot of stuff, but the F word is different. You can have one, but you can't have the ass crack. You can't get both, so they chose the ass crack. Well, the ass crack is, is pivotal to the plot. It is. It is. Very crucial. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Load Bearing Beams, the podcast about movies and relationships. That's what we used to say. I'm Matt Stokes. You sound like Danny Zuko. I'm Lacey Roth. Ooh, what are you talking about, Sandy? Oh, like, oh, you hold him balls too tight. I just won the carnival game. Now we're going to sing. A wop, bop, balloon bop. That'll never happen. We love each other. <laughs> we're such good friends. Okay. We go together. What is what is this? This is load bearing beams. Load bearing beams. Coming to you on eclipse day in the midst of the majesty of the celestial miracle that is the total solar eclipse in which it got eight percent darker than it normally would. Yes, it's also Rex Manning's day, so you might say that's a sexy Rexy total eclipse of the heart. You might say that. I did. That was the first thing I said when I woke up. Lacey did say this to me first thing when she woke up this morning. Like that. I was like, oh, sweetie. Uh-huh. Right. And we don't celebrate our anniversary, but this. Then we licked each other with our lizard tongues. Oh. So, um, okay. you know what I was thinking? You know how um, I, I, I feel bad for not caring more about the eclipse. I feel like mm-hmm. it's something that I would get into and then get mad at others for not caring about. Like, don't you understand? It's the... The, the 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 majesty of the universe and we're just objects in space we're part of space space you need something else to get mad at people about so look into it of the two of us you're the way matter one yeah so there's yeah. not room but check this out oh the last eclipse was seven years ago right right doesn't that feel like it was like four yes. days ago yes it does yes but at that time seven years earlier you and i didn't even know each other oh my god talk about a total eclipse time time is weird time's fucking strange christopher nolan will tell you um what are we talking about today on our podcast overboard the 1987 joint yeah directed by goldie hahn well kind of she's like a shadow director of all her movies as we'll get into but uh gary marshall directed this picture gary hey um Hey, we're glad to be doing this podcast. We have some great fans out there, actually, we getting do. more and more each week, which is weird. <laughs> uh, I always thought I wanted fans, and now they write to me, and I'm like, I don't, don't look at me. Mm. Um, right, I got my hair cut. Uh, elephant in the room. And, you um, look amazing today. Thank you. That well, that sounded sincere. Thank you very much. I'm usually I'm bullshitting when I. What are you? What? <laughs> You anyway, just, I was worried about my haircut in a weird way of like, well, what if someone writes and says it's dumb? I'm an on camera personality now. Yeah. So yeah. That, you know, news anchor, you got to get approval. So that's and what I, I did. approve. You're looking. Mm. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, but speaking of fans, so if they give us something cool or listeners, I don't know if fans sounds really pretentious. Um, friends. Friends, listeners. If they give us something cool, we can show it to you. But Lodies. <laughs> That's what but we this decided fan, they're called. That, fuck it, this listener slash friend um, s- sent something uh, audio to me. So I wanted to give that a little... She, she wrote us a jingle. Her name's Jen. She's the best. When you reminisce about the past, was the movie great or was it ass? If you're not sure, then check us out. The Load Bearing Beans Podcast. Yay! It gets stuck dog, in your head. Dog, dog, diggity, dog. It gets really, yes, it does. It's in it's there. It's an earworm. It is. Load bearing beams podcast. podcast. Like podcast. Like that part. Where I'm did, sure my face looks great when I do. Yeah. That. Hey, we have some studio time coming up. Maybe we'll. Uh, oh yes, because we're recording a. Uh, uh, a no, no, sh- no more. We won't say anyone. That's just a little tease for big oh, things happening soon. Here's a little tease. Uh huh. <gasps> oh, you're alert. like when Goldie Hawn shows most of her ass, uh, uh, including most of her ass crack. Yeah, I got into the depths. And we'll that... talk about thongs when we get into the movie discussion. But I have a, okay. I have a question for you because you're sort of the arbiter okay. of sort of morality and what's right in society. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but Overboard, tell me about your history with Overboard. Why'd you pick this movie? Okay. Um, I t- definitely had not seen it for at least 20, 25 years. It is one of those rare movies where it was a favorite of my dad's and I also became very attached to it 
that did not always happen. I feel fondly about dad movies, but did not always like, they weren't all my style. This one, I just remembered being really funny. A lot of heart. Um, I was hoping it would still have that. It was one of those ones where we could, I watched it anytime I was with my dad, like over the summer. But your dad, I'd never met the man. You, he, from what you say, it seems like he was a more mask. He was kind of like a Kurt Russell. Yeah. <laughs> this he and I was a little bit worried that this is going to be like, oh yeah, knock that rich bitch down. My, my dad had very toxic uh, energy toward women, especially if they were smart or had money or thought they were better than him. Um, and he let me know that he, he made it no secret. He wanted me to be a boy. Um, and I did my best to be that. And, uh, so I was a little worried there'd be toxic masculinity, masculinity in this movie in a, in a way that did not, I couldn't get past it. And, uh, it's there, but God damn, if I didn't get past it. <laughs> but you know, when you think about it, this movie's kind of fucked up. Oh, really? Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, the premise this is, is, this is terrible. A, yes. Um, just l- let it be known to all of you listening, watching. We're aware this is fucked up, and we will don't steal a lady. Talk about it in great detail. But your dad, he doesn't strike me as a rom com guy. But this mm. is like one of those. Cl- no, I mean rom com. Uh, he liked Death Becomes Her. He liked he liked funny things. This is a funny thing. Right? This is a ro- romantic comedy. Yeah, I know you're it right. It's about the chemistry right. of a man and a woman who love each other. Well, my dad never did get over my mom. And he never he never dated again. I wonder if he's gay. Why would he never date again? Huh. And, and anyway, Lacey just, thinks lots of <laughs> you. You think like nine out of ten men are gay though. So they need to just accept that and they'd be happier and then yeah. they could live their lives. Um. Oh, I did that pompous thing where I know you're waiting for me to talk, but I take, a, take sip a sip first. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Ew. I would never. I would never. Uh, you're, no, you're totally right. I can't really think of a bunch of comedies. I mean, uh, romantic stuff. He would not. He would have. It would have hurt him. I think he never did find another partner. And he was handsome and funny, but an alcoholic who uh, did not pay the light bill until the light bill, the lights were turned off. <laughs> this movie has. It plays the trick of like romantic comedies are for ladies. They're ladies' pictures. This movie, the ladies will like it, but the men can also like it because it's about a guy who goes bowling and drinks beer. Bada bing. Puts the little lady in a barrel. And Kurt Russell has just that sort of magic, I think 100% approval appeal. Well, tell me, backing out, just Goldie and Kurt in general, what do you think about them? We've covered, on the show, we've covered Death Becomes Her and last year we did First Wives Club. I don't think we've ever covered a Kurt Russell movie. I couldn't think of another one, actually. Um, I like him from this movie. He has a very strong uh, Patrick Swayze vibes to me. I think they look a lot alike. I, it, like if Patrick Swayze were uh, less cultured and didn't know how to dance, you'd get Kurt Russell. Yeah, I, I can see that. I think of, I mean, Swayze's run was so much shorter. And I think of Kurt Russell as just like this. What else is, please just like rattle off some stuff. I want to say like Westerns. Well, Tombstone, yeah, in the That's 90s. It. But That's where the, I know. The, the John Carpenter run, which I know you're not that familiar with, but it's Cape oh, from New York duh, and The Thing the and thing. Big Trouble in Little China. Okay, yeah. And well, I have a big slide about his career, but uh, okay. I, I think they're chemistry. I, but if you ask me what I think about them together, I, I think they're chemistry off the charts, I think. Walter White would be proud. Indeed. He would say, you don't you, need to. Just move on. What was the word he would say? I don't know. Apply yourself. They don't need to apply themselves. Okay. They've gotten it. All right. I'd never seen this movie. I was aware of it. You know, I will tell you, I thought that this movie was a much bigger hit than it was. It wasn't really a hit. Huh. But I feel like, isn't this one of like the totemic comedies of the 80s? It must have become that on like VHS. Can I have KD. a guess? Yes. Did it come out like when something else came out, like Romancing the Stone or something that would have been too similar and, and grab the same audience? Romancing the Stone was 84, I believe. So. Or, you know, I just wonder why. I mean... It's got everything. What the fuck? It does have everything. All right. Um, it pre- pre- does. Predictions. Predictions for the... For I the nailed movie. it. This might be the closest prediction I've ever fucking had in my life. When you reminisce about, about the past. past. Here's the song. It's stuck in my ass. Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn, get out of here. Come on. It's going to be adorable. I remember this being a blast to watch. I'm sure it won't be problematic at all. Um, I always like Goldie Hawn's physical comedy, so I think it'll hold up. Um, 
My dad loves this movie, so maybe looking back, I will see some problematic taking that rich bitch down a peg or two propaganda I might have been brainwashed with. We'll see. Okay, great. I would say maybe the movie would be better if it took the rich down more of a peg. It's like only critique is like, these these people are snobs. Yes, and I wish... I wish they didn't end up rich. I always found that to be such a happy ending. And now being an adult and knowing what what money can do and, and seeing how happy they are without it. And it, anyway, that, that kind of changed for me. It's the 80s. It's like, it was the, it's the Reagan 80s. It's the same thing with Back to the Future. You're like, wait a minute. So this story resolves with his family is now rich and he's happier as a result? Like, isn't the whole movie about... I know that's not true. <laughs> I know that that's... Um, like, where does he even, he even says it. It's like, before, give me a little girl when he asks, well, I don't know what I can even give you now. Yeah, that's a problem. I don't want to see this couple in five years. And I years. thought she was going to say you already have because like. These movies fall apart if you project five years. This was, <laughs> I wrote down like, this is the most, what the hell happens to these people after the movie, movie. Really? Yeah, right. like in that like, wait, what the, f- they're going to, this is all going to fall apart in like three days, just I'm, like their miniature golf course. Yes, it will. Uh, but that's, not, we only have to concern ourselves with the running time of the movie. Oh, okay. So quit running your mouth and tell me your prediction, lover. All right. Ahem. <laughs> As I sit here <laughs> and stare into the abyss. Jesus Christ. That is overboard. A thought occurs to me. I don't know what this movie is about (laughs) at all. They did a remake of the movie a few years back, and I remember there being talk of they gender swapped the roles, and that means Mm -hmm. it's no longer problematic. But I don't know what's problematic. I think this movie involves wife swapping. (laughs) I don't know. Gary Marshall directed this film. I don't have a huge regard for his filmography. I love Kurt Russell, but let me say... I am not the biggest fan of Goldie Hawn. <gasps> I'm sorry. I, I'm about to um, immerse myself into some of her best known work. I've never seen Private Benjamin. I'm going to maybe revisit Death Becomes Her. I just have a bad taste in my mouth after we did the first Wives Club a year ago, in which I really did not care for her. But we'll see. I guess I don't have high hopes for Overboard. <laughs> Swinging it. You know, I like this movie. Yeah! yeah it's, a, it's a fun movie. Yes, 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 yes. And I did, I recorded that a week ago. Fuck yeah. I think Fuck I was, yeah. my Goldie Hawn negativity is really only contained to the First Wives Club. Okay. Because she's, uh, d- I d- bleh, love her and Death Becomes Her. Yeah, I watched. Did you watch Private Benjamin? Yeah. Did you watch. Um, Private Benjamin fucking sucks. Oh, yeah, it's not good. Did you watch. Is it true Beverly Hills or no? That's the other lady. No, I watched. I watched Death Becomes Her. I watched Private Benjamin. I watched uh, Sugarland Express. I haven't seen that. Was there um, what else? I don't know. I'd have to pull up my letterbox, but no, no, she's 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 obviously great. I was really just concentrating on the First Wives Club movie. Yeah. I did not care for it at all. Uh, yeah, she's great, and she's great in this, and he's great in this, and this is. This movie, uh, the 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 power of this movie is it totally overcomes the ridiculous and you know criminal and evil yeah. premise it has. Yes. Be, oh, but these guys are so sweet. <laughs> it, it is it is so much a this movie could have been made in 1944. Uh huh. And um, it, you know, with with you put in whatever actors you want to put in. But this is not, I don't feel this is a movie that should have been remade. I feel like when you have chemistry that strong that are in the movie is hinged on like the way that these actors perform these roles so much. I think it's dangerous. I think it's very dangerous to think you could get it better. And I heard it's not great. The no, nobody liked it. And I was re- I was doing some research on the development of this movie and it was based on a real story. And that real story seems so huh. sad and devastating. What the fu- we- uh, but, but look, there is power in, and I was surprised to feel this while we watched the movie. There's power in, getting to start over and mm-hmm. also there's just sort of this fantasy of like what if i got to take over someone else's life and mm-hmm. like crushed it <laughs> i you don't understand how happy i get when the freezer's defrosted when she learns how to cook when she's reading to them when the house is clean when her clothes fit like i i just i love the whole thing i just 
a it it was the perfect time to have that movie and they did it just right and i was very surprised to see that the sexism or the things i thought would be a problem besides the overall kidnapping and brainwashing was um was really done well he doesn't even sleep in the bed with her until they are dating and like actually liking each other on 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 the real basis yeah he doesn't rape her on night one he just makes her think he's about to drunkenly rape her but then he doesn't it's nice for that time i mean i guess yeah for them to not even sleep in the same bed and and for him to actually not be drunk that he's pouring alcohol on him so she just thinks it and is scared for her life fine but when you really break down what his behavior is you think he's this absent dad and it's just no he's too proud to say he's has a night job so it's like he's not even going to the bowling alley it's just kind of wholesome and it's Wait. a crucial thing the screenplay does and this movie was written by a woman and i think she she uh, oh, there you go probably was more in, in key with like the creepiness of the of the premise and like so there's, there's some things we're gonna have to take care of like you said get the the sex that's not going to happen until later when it can be consensual. Now, can this ever be consensual? Whatever. Um, but I really think having her real husband also abandon her. Oh, yeah. Really wins you over to like, okay. Oh, yeah. She, she is had not, no choice. I mean, she didn't have a good option. That she she is not being uh, pulled. Like her husband also totally fucked her over. Right. She's She would be going into it if he doesn't like her that much. Her coming home would be just as bad of a situation. Yeah, because the worst thing anybody does in the movie is when her husband goes to see her in the uh, hospital and then decides, no, no. I'll just leave. That's not my wife. I'm going to leave her here. That's the, by far the cruelest thing that anybody does in this movie. So Kurt Russell's no, number two in terms of evil men in this movie. Yeah. And they make her so cartoonishly mean and Disney villain awful that you're ready for her to get treated a little bad, but I'm over it by like, the first couple of chores she has to do. And mm-hmm. <laughs> I think she takes truly really takes it on the chin though. I mean, like when she, when she gets on the sofa, like she's already accepted that that's where she sleeps. And then the dogs jump on her and she says, my body. I love that <laughs> part. And then you just see her sleeping with, she doesn't even move. She doesn't go to the floor. She just sleeps with the pots. Yeah. As this, <laughs> I don't know. I just think she kind of kept it together in a, a high level way. You gotta hand it to her. You gotta. It's almost really like do. it's a movie. It's um w- one of the reasons I like the show Community so much is at least in the beginning it, it there is I think a wish fulfillment we all have of like if we could just start over with strangers then just be a totally different person in our 30s or 40s or whatever. Hmm. And she gets the chance to do this even though she doesn't choose to do that. You kind of like project onto her like, "Yeah, what if I did suddenly have to be a totally different person? What would I do? What would I be like?" Right. Would I just make another version of this life with the same similar mistakes or would I if thrive? The different, yeah, different circumstances were thrust upon me. How would that make me different? It's kind of, there's some stuff going on in this movie. I Let's think so. talk about the... Uh, and the, I don't know. I, I don't love child actors. I really don't love them in the 80s. To get four boys, blondes, blonde, you know I hate blondes, four boy blondes that I like all of them. That's fucking magic right I, there. I thought we were in trouble when the opening credits are going and it's like, and introducing, and there's a block of four <laughs> actors. I'm like, like oh, that's fuck. That's too many. <laughs> that's four fucking rotten little shits. And they are, but in the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you want kids uh, kids on screen who are like real kids uh, yep. pieces of shit. Yeah. And, um, you know, I kept thinking of Malcolm in the Middle in this movie. Like I've their house seen. is messy and they're poor and they're all like violent with each other. Are they poor but, in Malcolm? Oh, yeah. They're just regular. No, they're, I mean, <laughs> Matt. they're like, no, though, that is the premise of Your the show. Your Mandeville is showing. That is the premise of the show. I thought Roseanne's premise was poor. So if they're. Two different shows, yes. I that, know that, but are they, this, would you say that they're same level? Because. I think they're sub Roseanne. Oh, I really haven't seen it. Uh, but I, I know really that agree. Roseanne, and I've never seen Roseanne. I know that Roseanne oh. did that too. It's like, let's show how people actually live, but they actually, pe- real people are actually overweight and their houses are messy and they're small. But Roseanne's house, I think, is more of a set. And Malcolm in the Middles is like single cam in a real house. And you get the uh, the claustrophobia and the kids sleeping on top of each other. And I know that. I guess I just always, it, it always signaled to me middle, middle lower, but not, I mean, you know, Roseanne's is nearly like food stamps. Mm-hmm. So I just wasn't. Yeah, this is like a family of six where that only has one, like the mom works at a, at a convenience store. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, history of this movie. There's a lot of different people to talk about, so we'll try to breeze through it, but we'll hey, start off with, yes. I thought I realized where I know him from. Um, the guy that I said is everyone's best friend in the 80s, the, the uh, Billy, is that his name? In the movie, he's Kurt Russell's Pratt. best friend. I don't yeah, remember the name. Pratt. I know his last name is Pratt. Um, is he the is he the voice of um, Mr. Potato Head? No, that's Don that Rickles. A, no, this this. A, oh no no no! Is he one of the 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 sponsor cars in Cars? Mm, like one of the. No. Damn it! I'm gonna no, this guessing. guy is from Friends. He's their landlord, Mr. Trigger. Okay. And yeah, he's just on a million sitcoms and like bit parts in movies. This is probably his like biggest actual role. Okay. He just looks like if Chicago were a person, he looks like it. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> the dog bears like that. All right. Talk. Nineteen eighty one, oh, a wow. Jane Doe case takes over the nation. And I had never heard of this story of this woman. Uh, uh, and I I did not spend, you know, a whole day trying to dig more into this, but all the news stories end in nineteen eighty one. So what happens to this woman after all of this? I don't know. But okay. nineteen eighty woman, a woman eighty one, a woman is found naked and near death in a state park near the beach in Fort Lauderdale. And she spends the next six months in a hospital in a psychiatric uh, facility, recovers her cognitive abilities, but never her memory. She's an amnesiac. She's known as Jane Doe the whole time. And she goes on good morning America and asks for help identifying her family. And this causes her real family to find her. That's our daughter. They come and claim her. And apparently they had been estranged for the previous five to seven years. What caused the estrangement? The articles don't really address that, and it's mostly from the mother's point of view. And I don't know anything, but I'm just like reading this and reading between the lines. And like, this doesn't seem okay. Like, we're not sure that's the mom? No, no, no. Just oh. like, you know, like a, the article's written from the point of view of like, there, there's this article, we'll link to it in Washington Post that interviews like lots of parents of, of ad- adults in their 20s and 30s who, quote, run away, unquote. And it's like these, the, the they stray these ne'er do wells. They go and they try to find themselves because they read some books in college. And who know? And now it's like, well, what were they gay? Were they trans? Like, right. what, what was really happening? We don't know. Um, and I'm not saying that's what was happening here. It's just very weird. You have a fo- a picture from a newspaper article. Is she on the right or the left? Which one is it? She's the one on the right, the small one. There's a small one. The one who doesn't have curly hair. The younger one. Okay. The small one. Yeah. The, 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 she, she reunites with her family. And uh, then there's some follow-up articles like, well, well, for one thing, she said she didn't want to go back to her old name. She just wants to be Jane Doe. <laughs> um, she doesn't, she never, she doesn't, re- at least in the follow-up articles, she still doesn't remember her parents, but she says they're nice people. And, um, and I'm not gay anymore. So it's working out. Yeah. So like this, Again, not knowing how this story actually ends, because there's no reporting that I could find after yeah. it, this seems like a very uh, tragic story. Mm-hmm. And I also wish I had more time to learn about amnesia and how it really works. Yeah, that's it's one of those things that I feel like it's just a plot device. I feel like I don't understand it in the wild. But this seems like a thing that Hollywood's like, the Jane Doe on Good Morning America, that'll make a great idea for a movie. Okay. So... Leslie Dixon, the screenwriter, is assigned to it. Earlier in 1987, she wrote a movie called Outrageous Fortune with Bette Midler and Shelley Long that was a big hit. Never heard of it, but uh, she gets commissioned to write the screenplay. She said, she said, quote, I was daunted from the get go by the idea that amnesia was the central plot device. I thought it was hokey, but I was in no position to complain. Somebody was paying me to write a screenplay, Mm. end quote. So she later writes movies like Pay It Forward. Freaky Friday, and she has a credit on the upcoming Inside Out 2. All right. And to direct the movie, they go to Gary Marshall. And he's busy eating a hamburger. What is this fucking picture you're showing me? (laughs) That's him eating a hamburger, presumably at Arnold's. He's the creator of Happy Days. He's a mega TV producer and then started directing in the 80s. Young Don, uh, what what is that? Young Don Juan. No, Young Doctor in Love. Young Doctor in Love. The Flamingo Kid. <laughs> Nothing in common. What the fuck are these movies? I don't know. I don't know either. But then he directs Beaches, Pretty Woman. Pretty Frankie Woman is an Jack. enormous hit. Frankie yes. and Johnny exited. And dear God, The Other Sister. I looked up the premise of The Other Sister. I know it what a, it is. 
I've seen it. It is an autism movie. I, I think the it's, they don't describe it as autism. They literally just say the R word in the premise of okay. the movie. Okay. And it's like, she wants to be in love. And people are like, I don't know about that. I bet it's a great movie to watch now. Yeah, fuck. Uh, Runaway Bl- Bride. And then, you know, he directed like The Princess Diaries. Oh, wow. Uh, and then ended his career making a series of holiday movies about <laughs> a lot of different people. <laughs> Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve, Mother's Day. Very important figure in filmmaking and TV and comedy. Uh, brother of Penny Marshall. We've never done a Gary Marshall movie before. I thought we had, but I was thinking. I mean, we're we're chipping away at the edges of stuff that I like. But yeah, mm-hmm. none of these are load-bearing beams. I was thinking Penny Marshall, who did A League of Their Own, which oh, we, previous episode of A League of Their Own. I mean, Pretty Woman is so many people's load-bearing beam. I don't know why it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Don't know why. Runaway don't know why bride. these things just attach. Um, no, but but uh, My Best Friend's Wedding. It's not, it. it's not a Julia Roberts aversion. It's just Beaches could never be a load brain being for me. It's too devastating. Frankie and Johnny I liked, but I remember being kind of serious. Exit to Eden. Oh, I mean, that one's just crazy. Yeah. Who's that in Dear God? Is that Greg Kinnear? Yeah. Okay. He's good in it. I remember liking that movie. I just probably rented it once, though. Look at how young Goldie Hawn is here. Okay. Goldie and Hawn. Okay. And Goldie and <laughs> Goldie and Hawn. Kurt yeah. and Russell. How do these people meet? Well, for, you know, right now they've been together for more than 40 years, but they've never been married. Right now, today, on today's date? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Goldie Hawn told Chris Wallace last year, quote, why should we get married? Yeah, it's work. Isn't that a better question? I like the idea that I can wake up in the morning and make decisions every day if I want to be here, end quote. Yeah, that's true. Now, you can do that if you're married, too. Get married. That's what God wants. That's what I say. Um, Shut up, Matt. <laughs> Okay, Goldie Hawn made her film debut in, in this movie in 1966, the one and only genuine original family band, a Disney movie starring the Disney child star, Kurt Russell. Oh, and this is how they Jesus. Meet. Kurt Russell was a Disney movie, like live action Disney movie star in the 60s and 70s. The computer wore tennis shoes. Uh, you let that, that's him on the right. Uh, so allegedly Walt Disney's final words were Kurt Russell before he died. <laughs> I don't remember the actual story. I, and it might have been he wrote it down and people were like, what did that... What is this? What about Kurt Russell? It was a money. It was like a Citizen Kane thing. Right. Kurt Russell. So, um, yeah, they, they met on the set of this movie. Uh, Goldie was five years older than Kurt. And then did Aww. they didn't meet again until uh, till the happens. 80s. And Goldie Hawn said in 2012, about when she met Kurt Russell in 1966, quote, I was 21 and he was 16 and I thought he was adorable, but he was much too young. And then years later, we met up again and I liked him. And I remembered that I liked him very much when I first met him. But we both said we would never go out with another actor, so it just shows mm. you never can tell. How much older than you am I, Matt? Four years. Just say five for the purposes oh, of this topic. <laughs> sorry, I didn't. Re- okay. No, yeah, you're okay. five years. Hey. And we met on the set of Law Firm, the uh, movie. Okay. Goldie Hawn, here was her deal. She broke out in TV on the sketch comedy show Laugh In mm-hmm. and kind of mi- had her niche playing dumb blondes, but she became an I- fashion icon, TV icon, movie icon, a giant star in the 70s. She won an Oscar. Best Supporting Actress for Cactus Flower hmm. in 1969. She's the star of Steven Spielberg's first feature film or theatrical feature film, The Sugarland Express, a very good movie. Uh, shampoo. And then she's like the producer and star of Private Benjamin in 1980, which was both an enormous hit. And she was nominated for Best Actress for that oh. movie for like a silly comedy. That's like how important it was. So when I watched this movie, I was like, I am prepared to be blown away. And let me tell you that movie fucking sucks. What sucks about it? Everything. Okay. Yeah. So the premise is she's like a rich princess. Ugh. I mean, she's like a spoiled rich girl who's, but she's in her, uh, you know, thirties who gets married to a nice man who then, who then dies on her wedding night, uh, as they make love. And now she has nowhere to go in life. So she decides to enlist in the army. What? And then there's like 20 minutes of her, like her drill sergeants being mean to her. And she's like, I want to talk to the manager of the army. Okay. Uh, but then don't, wouldn't you know it? She starts to get the hang of it and wow. starts to thrive. Now I assume that's what the whole movie's going to be, right? No. By minute 55, she's mastered it. She's, you know, a commissioned officer or whatever. <laughs> it's like, okay, well there's still an hour left to go. And it's like, she gets deployed to a, to Brussels and meets a man and has like a weird domestic drama with him. What? This movie why I mean, the the quote good the quote unquote good parts of the movie are like you have seen it all it's so predictable i guess it's a little charming but then the movie just keeps going and going wow. and going oh thank you don't see private benjamin keep it private kurt russell on the other hand was in those disney movies like the aforementioned computer wore tennis shoes but he wants to transition into being a legit adult actor 
and uh, he's looking around for picture for for projects, and he meets John Carpenter, and they first work together in a TV movie. Uh, called Elvis, in which he plays Elvis Presley. Supposedly, this is a really good movie. I could see that. I mean, he looks like Elvis. I've never seen this this movie, uh, mm. but apparently it's really good. But then they work together a bunch more, including Escape from New York, which is his sort of big, you know, adult breakthrough playing Snake Plissken, iconic action hero, and then The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China and... Uh, what else to escape from LA? Whatever. You know, he's also in Silkwood and used cars and he sort of breaks through, but he's always like... At least during their their both of their heydays, she was a much bigger star than mm-hmm. he was. I think Kurt Russell was always a. Why isn't he a bigger star than he is? It feels okay. like it feels like he's always on the precipice, and it never really happens. I mean, there's Tombstone. There's like, I don't know. It, you think it's because the Goldie Hawn connection? Like, there's just like a pushback. Like, you know, you can't have it all. No, it just doesn't happen for people. But I, I think I think he's also like. I was gonna say Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie got together after they were both mega stars. Maybe if you come up together, you, only mm. one of you gets to be it. Just there's there. I don't know. There's maybe it's he, he, just not picking the right movies at the right yeah. moments. I don't know. But he's had, he's a legend. He's had a long career. He's he's amazing. He's a he's a person I like more and more the older I get. Mm-hmm. And I I feel like so many, um, like the reason he played Star Lord's father in Guardians of the Galaxy two is because it's like. Chris Pratt's uh, Chris Pratt's sort of ideal uh-huh. movie persona is sort of Kurt Russell, but he hasn't really followed that path. Uh, Got it. Anyway, I forgot. I forgot about him in that role. He's very good in that. Yeah, and he had like his Quentin Tarantino movies, and he's in the Fast and Furious movies. Oh, he's 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 doing good. Look at him with um, his long hair in his library. All right, glasses. now 1984. They both are auditioning for a movie called Swing Shift, or but he's auditioning. I think I think Goldie Hawn is a producer doesn't have to audition but this is jonathan demi's movie his big follow-up to his movie melvin and howard and she had they they reconnect during the audition process and she had kids from previous marriage including kate hudson and she said no seeing how kurt russell interacted with them like won him over to her Mm. uh but yeah so the movie gets a lot of attention like look these two beautiful stars are falling in love while they make this movie but this movie swing shift have you seen it no it's um it's not a very good movie, but it is like a very famous story of a the star producer Goldie Hawn like feuding with the director and basically seizing control of the movie to retool it uh around her and to to like sort of boost the love story between the two of them. There is this I'll I'll put a link to this this uh, uh, sight and sound story about about the story of this movie because there's a a very famous director's cut that apparently is great that is very similar and yet totally different from the the final cut. Um, okay, but what are you saying? Are you saying she's a nightmare? Or not that you she's saying a ni- not, she was blinded by love. That she she had uh, I think maybe wanted this to be more like a Private Benjamin style comedy, silly comedy, and the director wasn't necessarily on board with that. Okay. And, um, but that's the movie where they, where they, they fall in love and their relationship takes off and, um, yeah. And then Overboard. And then Overboard. Okay. Uh, not, not, not a giant hit. I was surprised by that. Uh, it makes $26 million at the box office on a $22 million budget. The reviews were mixed. Roger Ebert has this review where he grudgingly gives it three stars but he has this quote. Who fucking asked him. There is hardly a major development in this story that we can't predict 30 minutes in advance. But what does it matter when the performances are so much fun and there are so many comic delights along the way? This is the kind of movie that not only could have been directed by Frank Capra or Preston Sturgis, but may have been. End quote. I was thinking of Frank Capra's um, It Happened One Night, which I actually just watched. And it has kind of a it's Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. And she's like a rich heiress mm-hmm. and she gets stuck with. Clark Gable, who's more salt of the earth, and he teaches her how to be like regular folk, and then got it. Yeah, um, yeah. In 2017, Goldie Hawn went on the James Corden show, and she said she and Kurt Russell got into bed one night together to to make love. Stop saying it That's like that. That's what she Just says. Say fuck. Okay. She said make love. It doesn't mean you have to say it. And she said they caught this on TV, and instead they settled in and watched the whole thing. It reminded caught them what on TV overboard. Oh, and it reminded them while they fell in love. Mm. Okay. Yay. That's the history of. So to get them going for sex. No, they it just prevented. It cock blocked them. They didn't make love because. 
Okay. Instead, they're old. They you lost- cock blocking my joke, man. Oh, sorry. That's fine. I just like that this is their Viagra, both of them. Let's watch Overboard. Yeah. It doesn't matter, Matt. We open at sea. A giant pleasure yacht soars majestically across the sea, but then we cut into the harbor that is Elk Cove, Oregon. Now, there is a real Elk Cove in Oregon, Lacey, but it's inland. This town right here is not the real Elk Cove. It appears to be a stand-in for Newport, Oregon. Oh, okay. Where some second unit was shot for this movie. Some second unit. Yeah, like footage of like footage B-roll. of B-roll. The- not, not B-roll, oh. but the establishing shots of boats oh. coming in and shit like that and the bridge and, and stuff. But, you know, right away we see there's some hardworking folk, salt, salt of the earth type. They're doing their fishing and they're, they're tackling. Boating. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. tackling, they're blocking, they're punting. In contrast, this big prestigious yacht comes into harbor at the same time. I would also look up and be like, mm-hmm. I wondered the whole time, why is this yacht going into this port? What are they doing here? I do not know. Don't worry about it, though. Oh, okay. It just seems like they're on their way back to New York from whatever fabulous place they left from. And they're just, you know, they had to get some work. The boat broke. Well, no, he's he he, Edward Herman wants to come in here to shoot some skeet. No, he's just shooting skeet to keep himself busy. The the boat is broken. You're wrong. No, he wants to stay here for two days to shoot skeet. And what is she going to do the whole time? Uh, I'll take care of some carpentry in the meantime, she says. No carpentry gets done in two days, but fine. All right. Um, Yeah. And then giant text on screen says, Randy Newman has a song in this movie. So the whole time you and I were like, when's it coming? Here come the boat in the harbor. <laughs> you're kind of a rich bitch, but now you're kind of special. Something special's cooking in my kitchen. It's poultry. It's gonna kill us all. Kurt Russell, he's the most, he's the saltiest of all the earth. I can taste him. His name is Dean Prophet. You get it? Prophet. Because the real wealth is in his pants. Yeah. So he's like a very Kurt Russell esque regular guy. I and feel like he is. He's doing like kind of unspecific blue collar stuff. Like he's hopping from boat to boat. He's like, hey, you got a banjo there. Good job. What? He's fiddling with his tool belt. Okay. He's and, a carpenter. Uh, it says so on his Sanford and Son truck. But, well, we don't know that yet. But we meet his best friend, Billy, played by Michael Haggerty, whose name we couldn't remember earlier. And uh, yeah, he, he, Kurt Russell, Dean, he gets summoned to the yacht. And we hear in voiceover, very hoity-toity Goldie Hawn, I simply cannot sit in this cesspool by the sea for two days. Are you a count? <laughs> and um, yeah, she's hired a carpenter to do some remodeling while her husband shoots ski. And then, and then we also meet her husband, Edward Herman. What, what is her husband? Uh, 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 Reginald. No. no um, um, Gordon. What is her husband's name? Oh, um, Grant. Grant. Yes. There you go. Oh, yes. So, so rich. And um, yeah, he does. He does his like fancy pants skeet shooting. Later in the movie, Kurt Russell and, and his friend, they do real hunting. They hunt, hunt like real varmints. Oh, I didn't even notice that. But yeah, no. But right away, they lay, let you know what kind of guy this is. Because mm-hmm. like, that's my wife's department. And he walks off like a fucking jerk. Mm-hmm. You could still just tell the man he's hot or cold. Wife here, hot or cold. Yeah, but it's like, it's sort of like um, Beetlejuice. Where he's like, my wife's a nightmare, so I just kind of let her do her own thing, and I'll just go off by myself. Yeah, fine, but it it more paints him to be the, um, I mean, a nightmare, but also just really inconsiderate of other people in in general. Sure, sure. That uh, he can be annoyed with his wife. He doesn't have to be a total dick to this guy who's uncomfortable on his boat. No, but there. I mean, <sighs> we here we do real we're doing rich it again. people. Real rich people. They think that. Everyone who's not rich, they think you and I are worms. They, they're they actively trying to get rid of us. They want us to go to our own planet so they don't have to look at us. It's, you know, it's real. Uh, the, the unreal thing is how, like, shitty she is to Kurt Russell because I think real rich people, like, they, yeah, they want you dead. They think you're scum, but they'll be, like, like polite to your face. Yeah, like uh, saccharine, like, it, like you get, is that the right word to use when it's, like, overly mm-hmm. sweet? Sure. Put on. Yeah. Well, then, then we meet Goldie Hawn's character, Joanna. 
uh, a shot of her first descending the stairs. First, we see her legs, and then she walks into frame wearing this like queen's garb, and she has a Cruella Deville cigarette holder. It, but it's not queen's garb. It's it's cosplay for the sea. I mean, it's like it's a fake sea cap. It's the, it's the fucking prince. It's whatever Prince Eric's dad wears when they get married oh, okay. on the boat. <laughs> it's that, but it's sparkly. You don't so think she's supposed to look kind of royal right well, of here? Of course, but it's stolen valor. She's pretending to be the captain of a boat when that actually takes education and effort. Sure. She's the captain of the boat because she put on this outfit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all just, you know, the way rich cosplay in other people's realities. Yeah. You need to make a living. I just pretend I'm a captain and boss you around. And that that her husband like really goes into that at the end of the movie, like in the last four minutes of the movie. He sort of goes nuts and is like, I'm the captain now, see? <laughs> he literally has a breakdown. Yeah. And I didn't get therapy when I had a nervous <laughs> breakdown. I do miss people calling them nervous breakdowns, just in general. Let's bring it back, Let's bring folks. That back. Bring it back. Just non-specific. You're being whiny right now. Can you tell us a little bit about like what is what kind of rich bitch is she? What is her personality like? Well, she's unlike anything we've ever met. And I think that's intentional. I mean, we do need to be able to like really hate her for a minute. But she's completely in a societal bub- bubble you and I will never experience. And they go out of their way to call her a debutante. I mean, she's basically never been touched by poor people. Mm-hmm. She And when she makes her phone call to her mom, it's, you know, okay, yes, you are a third, fourth, fifth generation of just the most wretched kind of spoiled asshole. I can't think of words. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. They're just coming not easily to me right now. Um, Yeah. So she's just never worked hard a day in her life and, and she's aggravated. She doesn't like her life. She's, she's pissy and bored. She speaks in this haughty, Lacey said it's a count voice. She sounds like a countess. That that I think she does, Goldie Hawn does a good job of calibrating the voice down to by the end of the movie she just talks like a normal Goldie Hawn character yeah, like poor but in things the beginning <laughs> just kind of hell no not like poor oh things? the movie yeah. poor things yeah 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 <laughs> um, you don't notice it going away but it's gone because she sounds like such an oddball when she's first in the house she's oh. Yeah, no, I don't know what mm-hmm. she says, yeah. but it's just like, oh yes, you don't sound correct, my lady. It's funny how you can have an amnesia, remember nothing of your history, but your voice just is. Because the way I take her voice, it sounds put on. It sounds like what rich people do to make it sound like they're worldly and are traveled. It's like weirdly European. It doesn't really seem like it's from anywhere in the United right, States. Yeah. So it seems it it literally seems put on. So when you wake up and you have no memory of your life, but you remember to do this. Go fetch me. It's like, the, am the, I a queen? Yeah, I don't know how uh how solid the science is mm. in this movie in mm-hmm. terms of amnesia and what how it works and what you would retain but not retain. Yeah, we meant to look into that. I don't know if the voice is like is that a literal physiological change that happens to you if you talk like that your whole life that i don't know i don't know i don't know hey is their yacht supposed to be tacky i can't tell no no, it's at the time that would have been the height of luxury i mean it's just supposed to be opulent it's supposed to be gaudy i don't i don't even think it's supposed to be like trump gaudy i think it's supposed to be a kind of taste not a bad one but Mm -hmm. it is fucking ugly so fucking ugly yeah it looks cheap but i know all the stuff is expensive basically everything's silk i do want a yacht it's the water don't have silk. You want a yacht? I want, Seems like such a fucking bummer. Yeah, and simultaneously, I think like the existence of yachts proves that like we need a communist revolution. But right. uh, yeah, I do look at it and I'm like, hmm, I'd be I nice. I get it. Okay, but wait, here's how I will talk you out of a yacht in five seconds. We would have to have a staff. You literally want to be stuck on a small vessel. No. With people you don't know that aren't me. No, I don't. Okay. No, I really just want a hotel. And like by that, I mean, can we go to a hotel for like a night? Please? I would like that. We're Is going it, too soon. Maybe You, you promise? You're the, you said we we're going done. to go see that podcast. Love, this is the podcast we're doing. Oh, um, oh I forgot to mention, we meet Roddy McDowell as the uh, as Andrew the butler. And he's also a producer of this movie. Hey. But uh, L- Lacey just met, we watched the original Planet of the Apes recently, so Lacey just met him where he plays Cornelius. Oh, I was wondering, okay, you've had me staring at this <laughs> slide for what feels like 10 minutes, and I kept waiting for you to make the monkey reference. Like, why is this here? He is Cornelius. Yes. Okay. Yes, he's in all of the original Planet of the Apes movies, except for part two. There's other Planet of the Apes movies? There are five in the original series. They're good. Oh, they which get- one did I see? 
you watched Planet of the Apes one. That was good that we started there. <laughs> um, they get they get progressively have a lower and lower budget, but they're good. They're they're That's very good. Interesting. It did not. It didn't take off. They're just like you know what. There's a lot of stuff in this world to explore. <laughs> Be damned if the producers think so. At the, no, at the time, it was sequels, that was like, the, the sequels was uncouth. It'd be like a thing oh. that, that Dean the Carpenter would do. I, it, so it's like they make money, but we're not going to spend real money on this. The first it, one, yeah. It's for horror movies, right? Like it's for it's for genre movies. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, oh, you would need that to keep going. You don't have any other ideas. Huh. Yeah, so none of them have like the prestige and the sheen of the first one, but they're like, man, they, these these movies, they're saying something, they have a political conscience. Okay. Uh, Roddy McDowell is in, he plays Cornelius in part three. Someone else played him in part two, but then he came back. Meaning he's one of the few people I can, that thing I like to track of an actor who gets recast and then the original actor comes back and I can only think of a handful. Yeah. I was wondering if we could add um, Nev Campbell to that, but she wasn't recast. She just didn't go. She just wasn't in Scream 6. Right. No, no. But now she'll be in 7. Right. Somebody else would have had to play Sidney Prescott. Which would have been... There would have been a riot in the street. Just one. But a riot nonetheless. Mm. There would have been riots. Okay. People are very precious about that movie. It is one of my favorite scary movies of all time. So, uh, yeah. And she she berates Roddy McDowell, who bring, bring her subpar caviar. Caviar should be round and hard and of adequate size. It oh, my God. Burst in your mouth. Dick joke. <laughs> First spit take. Have you, um, have you ever eaten caviar, Lacey? No. Okay. I yeah, you I sh- sure. I'm sure it was like sprinkled on top of something and I just wanted to say that I eaten caviar. I I remember it's salty and uh, otherwise gross. Eh. Okay. So what is, what is she, she's she's hired Kurt Russell Dean to do what? To improve her her closet, which when it opens and you see the closet that's on a fucking boat, we're supposed to be like, "Holy shit, that'd be an amazing closet even on land." But she's immediately like, "Oh, it's disgusting. My shoes are on the floor. How embarrassing." Also, I need drawers for my lingerie. I can't just keep opening boxes with lids. So, he's going to pop in there for he's got 48 hours and he's going to make this custom I, I it's no good being an adult and knowing these things are <laughs> That, there's no way he could make that in two days. Mm. Anyway, Plot hole. he's a little construction genius. Anyway, he, but she's like, don't touch me and don't touch anything and don't look at stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get your stink on all of this, you baboon. Right. But she's just naked all the fucking time. Well, she has this flesh colored bathing suit that and makes a, you think she's naked. But is that bow in her hair? No, it's like on the but it, it looks like she's framed in this in the still we're looking at but she is framed by the camera to look like she has a a, a, pre, a presence bow over her asshole um and then you know she has this very revealing thong as very well revealing. uh and and i did want to ask you Lacey, mm. what's the deal with thongs i don't find them attractive i always thought of them as they are useful because visible panty lines vpls or they go in and out of fashion and when they are out they are fucking out as hell when were they last out are they out now no but they're they're neither no because like it's like kind of like whenever feminism kind of has a nice little wave vpls come back in because it's like fuck you this not having visible panty lines is for men that is for men to enjoy we are comfortable having our butts covered not a fucking piece of fabric straight up our ass crack that's that's for men so or women who like women huh but women like sure i don't fucking know i mean it, it, it's weird i've i used to be repulsed by them and not until maybe three years ago did i even consider showing panty lines it's like whatever you grew up with it gets fucking ingrained now she is wearing something called a french cut thong though hmm. and that's actually flattering in a way because it ex- it, it brings your eye all the way up to the top of your hip it cuts all the way up so it makes her leg look like a quarter long than it actually is so it it's actually something that works it's just not in style at all how do you find out if something's in style by looking around matt Oh, okay i just wanted to know you have questions i have answers i'm not like i don't i mean i'm not really great at figuring out what's on trend and stuff i just i start to notice it a lot and almost by the time you notice it it's it's out again but i know when things are not okay to wear mm-hmm. so i stick with classic silhouettes <laughs> 
I guess the point of the thong is that this allows Kurt Russell to see that she has a birthmark on her. Oh, you were ass. literally asking me what's the point of it in this movie? No, no, no. I oh. wanted to know. Yeah, of I wanted course. to know. Um, I guess like why is it not considered nudity if you could see her whole ass, say for like five percent of the top of the ass crack? Yeah, I mean it is. I don't think you could wear that to like a children's pool. I mean, you wouldn't get arrested for indecent exposure, I guess. But if if you weren't her size, I'll bet you'd get harassed. He finishes the closet job, but she's not She's not happy about it. Oh, I was going to say this about the rich. They are constantly begging you not to look at them and that they're not bored and that they don't like to stir up drama, except for she's half naked, pointing her ass at the window of the room he's in, talking loud, talking about him, talking all kinds. Co- she's bored as fuck. She loves that there's a stranger on the boat. She loves that he's handsome. She wants him to look and then she wants to complain that he's looking. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's all very, look at me, stop it. How dare you? Her, her outfit is fucking borderline personality as shit. Is what that is. Which he he says. He says, you're not actually unhappy with the closet. You're you're just looking for things to be upset about because you're bored. Yeah. When, when she says she's not going to pay him for the work he's done because he made the closet out of cedar. When, or no, out of oak. When everybody knows closets are made out of cedar. Okay. Well, in, in movies, when there's rich people, you expect them to be eccentric and you expect them to be out of touch or, and maybe mean and cruel and stuff. But like, they should pay you. I just, when he doesn't get paid, just I, I'm like this. I'm just I'm revolted. It is the yeah. It's it's beyond uh, cruel. And being a person that's bought a hammer, brag. <laughs> when you see him, when you see her throw over his whole toolbox, and you know some of those were handed down. You know some of those are family tools, and she just fucking throws them in the. They're nothing to her, and makes me very angry, Goldie. It is. Fucked up. But you know, that is another thing about the rich. You're like, you have endless money. What's it to you? But they're also cheap, cheap fucks. But, and they used to get, it's funny. And when you're rich, you do get things for free. You get a better table placement. People send you gifts. And I mean, rich people are always talking about how they get comped just because their status makes them worth having around. Yeah. So she says, you didn't do the job right. Everyone knows you make closets out of cedar. And he's like, you didn't, well, you didn't tell me that. Uh, uh, and she says, well, you're fired. And he says, well, oh, fine. I'm happy to get off. Just pay me what you owe me. No, I won't. And then she pushes him over. Well, first he berates her. So you're a, you're bored and you're a bitch. I don't like that he gets real close to her when he's saying that, but everything else I like. Hmm. Well, um, she does this kind of him calling her a bitch um, and calling her bored. She does sort of spiral now thinking about this. I'm not a bitch. He, he called me a bitch. I'm not a bitch. Am mommy. I mommy? Am right. I a bitch? And this reminded me of the time that you asked me Ugh, if you I'm are not sweet. Annoying. Oh, that one. <laughs> and I said, "No, you're not sweet." And you're like, "I'm not. I'm not sweet." Well, you said. I said, "If you had to, if you you said, <laughs> if <laughs> if I only got five words to describe you, sweet would not be in the top five. No. Yes, you did say that. No, I yes, of course I would not include. The, I would include five other amazing things, but I, they're not well, sweet. Okay, but at the time when you're raised, when you're a girl, when, when you think that that's the thing you bless the fucking world with, is how accommodating you are and thoughtful, and how you make a big deal about birthdays and holidays and fucking care about your kids, whatever it is. You don't do those things other than the sweet kids. Sweet is, I know, but you took it away in a way that it's never been taken from me before. <laughs> I never thought about it, and I realized I don't really value that in my myself there are lots of other things i'd rather be than sweet but i i think a lot of people do think i'm sweet matt they do who thinks you're sweet no one that knows me real well though (laughs) (laughs) they do you're a you're a devil you're uh what the fuck why start there (laughs) you're very funny i'm sorry you're hilarious you're smart you're wicked sexy i'm snot Smack. Oh, I'm wicked smack. You're okay. wicked smack. <laughs> you're, you're a devil snot. You're a devil. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Lacey, this surprised me and how upset. I am. Tell me I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mom, he says I'm not. I thought you knew. Anyway. I, no, I'm not. Uh, I now can take pride in it, but you you, you made me like un- Doc, indoc- indoctrinate myself uh, by having to think about that for the first time. I'm not sweet. Oh, and okay, now we get a glimpse at her mom for the first time. What a fucking mess. Just head to toe covered like a Victorian something. Pampering herself with that little thing that you do with the pat the chin. It's like an old method of trying to keep your skin tight around your face. Um... 
anyway, it's just like, okay, yeah, I get it. This is where Goldie comes from. All of this makes sense. Blah, blah, blah. It is good to show like, but her mom's even worse. Her mom is even like more yeah. shitty to the help. Uh, and that her mom is babying her. Like she, Goldie Hawn calls her mom, mommy. And- well, and clearly Goldie does have some thoughts about having children, but she's not, I mean, as soon as she says it, her mom shuts it down and says, but baby, once you have a baby, you won't be a baby anymore or the baby anymore. And you just know Goldie grew up her whole life with a mom that resented the attention that was taken away from her once she mm. did have a beautiful daughter. So it's, you know, it's just very telling. It's like, okay, well, the least I could do is not f- fuck over my mom's life anymore by having an adorable grandchild who will then get all the attention. So it's just, it's the, it, it helps you forgive Goldie when you need to. It's the rare pressure from the mom or the parent to not have a baby. You don't see that as much. Because she's just a very specific kind of narcissist who hates that her daughter's beautiful and loves it and just can't risk that but on is still a grandchild. Obsessed with her daughter, is up her daughter's ass. And her daughter, like Goldie Hawn was 43 at the time of filming this movie. But she's supposed to be in her 30s, right? Like, uh, I mean, yeah. But okay. I mean, yeah, too old to be doing this. I read this Washington Post column written by this advice columnist who said like her her kids who are in their 30s had to have an intervention with her to stop texting them good night every night <laughs> and i was like oh that is oh god well why do you tell the press oh well she it was or like goldie said it huh no 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 this the, the, this was this has nothing to do with goldie hawn oh what the fuck are we talking i was just about? reminded of a of a writer who said like she's like my kids taught me something about myself that i I do have this hang up where I have to text them every night. Good night. Even though they're in their mid thirties. Uh, what is your point? It just made me think of, of, of parents of adult children who can't like get out of their way, who still think of them as babies. It's good. It makes sense. Yeah, I know. I love it. Yeah. Can we move on? Okay. No, no now, because Jesus Christ. Okay. So Goldie is, pretending i'm sorry what is her fucking name joanna is yes. pretending to have her period she's got like a heating pad on her stomach she's clearly not in, at all interested in her husband in any kind of a way um and he's just like oh i want you so bad joanna why how can you always be on your period but we know the rich aren't into period sex that's just something we know about them but yeah she's always telling she's apparently always on her period it's so. all that silk um, but he's not a helpful person. He doesn't love her either. He just, you know, because she, well, I mean, oh, she's probably her 80th request for the day, but she's like, oh, my, oh, crap, my, my wedding ring. I've left it on the whatever. Please go get it. And he just shuts that down. That will not be something I'll be doing. Um, and then so she very, very much like a child because he wants to finish something he's watching. It's a countdown on TV and they're on the countdown part of it. And they do, they're at 10. And so she gets on her robe and it's fussing about all in front of the fucking TV. When you know, there's no such thing as rewind of TV. It, I'm, I am stressed and I don't even like him. <laughs> and I'm just like, go to gather. God damn it. They're on nine, you know, the whole time. Um, but then she goes out to where she, she left her big giant ring on the boat and she Falls over like Rose. One more thing about the TV, though. I love this TV. I love this yacht bedroom TV and the VHS show. Are those VHS shows? Yeah. Oh, 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 my Lord. Oh, puppet. Speaking um, of VHS. And I think the uh, thing he's watching is like 10 best yachts or something. It is. And yeah. he wanted to see if he made it. Um, She falls overboard. And also, Roddy McDowell Drink. is... Drink! Roddy McDowell is illegally listening to their conversation because he has their bedroom bugged. Oh. It's in the big seashell that Edward Herman like cuddles up with. So he's listening to them on <laughs> headphones. And then Edward Herman is listening to the TV real loud. So nobody hears that Goldie Hawn falls overboard. And she's really far from the shore. So um, she's fucked. And I, and I always thought she went in unconscious. But that, and it is interesting how she's swimming. She's flailing about. And the next you hear of her, she's got amnesia and she's in the hospital. So it's like, what? Oh, they said that she hit her head on the garbage thing that found her. So it's like right as they discovered her, she went unconscious. Right. And I assume she washed up to shore and then washed it a second time and realized this boat picked her up. Sure. And uh, we, we have a <laughs> we have a news broadcast by this guy who looks so much like 8chan's Jim Watkins. It was, oh. I was I was like, what the? Wow. I Except he doesn't the, have a mustache. I love the name of the of the radio. Of the TV, TV. station is oh, K-R-A-B yeah. Crab. Mm. K-Rab. I don't think he looks like. And, and you I know, know you I, never do. Okay. You never think anybody looks like a thing. Because I'm all right when I think it and you don't see it and you see it. You have weird face stuff. 
All right. Um, so now she's on the news. She's been picked up. It's the mystery lady. She has amnesia. She's a horrible bitch. Uh, we know this because she instantly says to the news reporting woman that's very sweet, interviewing her, trying to help her. What a bad wig. I, mean, I didn't even realize it was a wig. Um and and it's funny, like the, the 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 camera, the news camera, like lingers on the reporter, and the reporter's just lost for words and looks devastated. <laughs> right. Well, her husband is the news anchor, and she's the wife, and then like oh, her okay. son is running the camera. It's, <laughs> it's all a family thing. So it's just like, oh, burn. yeah. Everyone who comes into contact with with Goldie Hawn is like, Gee, Jesus Christ. Right. So then you see her being mean to this the different staff uh, and very mean, and then she's mad about and, this quality of the eggs quality of the eggs and um and that she has a semi-private room and she looks at the <laughs> old lady who's sick next to her and she says you snore <laughs> and then and then they just they're sick of being yelled at so they do move her to a private room but it haha jokes on her because it's in the it's in the ward area for the the unwell mm. but um but we don't ever see that room i'm sure it's fine the next time we see her though is when her husband is well, no, that's he, not right. He wakes up. The husband wakes up on the yacht with the TV still on and is seeing the news broadcast. Right. All of this has happened overnight. The husband is seeing his wife's on TV and the doctor's on TV. And he's like, I will personally put up the reward. Please, somebody come get her. Why would you have to reward someone for coming? Why wouldn't he be rewarded for finding her? That's the joke is the doctor's yeah, like, I, I need to get rid of her so badly. I know. I don't um, Yeah. And then her husband, Grant, goes... And he's about to pick her up, but then he overhears his wife berating the staff, going full Karen on them. And he's like, nope, that's not my wife. Yep. And yeah. then and there's even a shot of him leaving the fucking hospital. So, like, it's public knowledge that it. I'm saying Kurt Russell's character, Dean, he sees that she's been left there. Because there's the shot of him, like, covering his face and... Yeah. And Dean Dean is at a bowling alley doing some repair work. I love how well observed the layout of this bowling alley is. Man, me too. It's Every bowling alley has that weird other room. <gasps> Lazy. I know. I You're, love it. I wrote down like I I wrote down I fucking love this bowling alley. There's a bar adjacent to it with the little window yes. and straight out of the sadly defunct Tiffany Lanes of Mandeville, yes. Louisiana, just the scuzziest, grossest because that's how you keep it legal. You you can sell beer, but you have to do it through a little hole. Or, <laughs> well, like, the adults are supposed to go into the bar area and get their beer. But that doesn't, that's inconvenient. So there's this little hole, and it's like someone can just kind of, like, stick their head in at, at the concession area and be like, we need a beer over here. So yeah. that's what it's for. And he goes in there to get a bag of chips and then sees on the news, sees, it's like, hey, there's that bitch. The fucking t- bitch i tell you she's rich on the bitch. television and his friend um his friend what is we keep forgetting his billy friend, pratt billy pratt is there and he's like hey i got a little idea he, well wait but billy doesn't have the idea no he tells billy okay. he, he hasn't thought of a plan and he thought of it fast he's gonna go uh steal her ass oh <laughs> thank you dr seuss <laughs> He goes over to the hospital, and and I, I haven't mentioned yet. There's this uh, kind of annoying, but I kind of like it. Alan Silvestri score that keeps coming up. It's this, it's this bass note that's like, uh, oh yeah. And um, after we watched this movie, I was watching uh, WrestleMania by myself. Oh, totally. And sometimes when I watch live sports on TV, I will play a bass because bass doesn't make a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. I learned this from Elvis Presley, who did the same thing. So, I, but I was just playing this like for an hour straight, just this bass line from this movie. Um, but yeah, it, it, and there's also this banjo, but it, it is used well in this movie because whenever is. something ridiculous happens, the score just comes back and then the movie just jumps forward and it's just kind of relentless editing. Uh, good, good filmmaking, I say. Yeah, I think that the, like the banjo is perfect for like the, the difference between the opulence and the, and the, not just, it's not blue collar, it's below that. Like the, these people are struggling um w- w- the way dean and his four kids are living um so the banjo it's used i don't know how but it's used lightly like it's not it's not like beverly hillbillies it's not overly silly it's just like yeah, it sets the tone i'm, I'm telling well, yeah, yeah, yeah it immediately signals to you like i'm in deliverance or i'm in bonnie and clyde uh uh but with a winking nod but it's somehow charm like I- i'm i'm happy to be there Honestly, mm-hmm. I'm like relieved. It's it's a relief from the fucking yacht world. So Dean shows up at the hospital and this is and Joanna Goldie Hawn. He's like, that's my wife, Annie. Joanna. Annie. Oh, you get it? I didn't. I didn't know where it came like, from. I was like, is, don't give her dead wife's name. Ew. Okay. 
It would be funny if he was doing that, if it was Vertigo. <laughs> Could make her look more like my wife. <laughs> he, uh, he's like, you're my wife. This is my wife. And she's like, this missing link is not my husband. But um, the, the he then he's like, well, maybe you'll remember this. And he kisses her like the World War II photo, uh-huh. the sailor, and like the doctor and the cop are high-fiving. They all like it. <laughs> Got him. And um, he's like, uh, can you prove that you're married? And he's like, well, she has a birthmark on her ass. And she's like, I, I would never have married you. Where did we meet? And he's like, we met at Hank's Donuts in Seattle. You were in the Navy. So I guess that was like a Private Benjamin joke. Oh. She's like, I was in the armed forces. Okay. Um, but yeah, the doctors are like, well, we have no proof that he's your husband, but he seems like a nice guy. So uh, off you go. Well, OK. But then he's right about the, the strawberry fucking high up birthmark on her ass. That proves it. That does not prove that he's her husband. Wait, but that's what they use as proof. You didn't say that he like he he gave the proof and he won. You didn't say that I part. I did just say that he knows no. about the birthmark on her ass. But then she confessed. Okay, whatever. Fine. Everybody is motivated to get this woman yes. moving along. So yes. it's good enough for them. And again, I think Gary Marshall does a good job of like some ridiculous shit happens. There's a very like obvious joke and then just cut for it. Now she's riding in the back of a truck. Okay. Which is kind of wild that he puts her in the back of the truck because <laughs> the dogs are up front. And it, but, but he excuses everything with we're supposed to get right back to what your life is actually like. I know this might seem weird, but this is what you do. This is, I don't know. You like it. You just always like this. You, you do that. And it's like, uh, like, this is the part where I'm like he's gonna actually break this person's brain <laughs> yeah like, i wonder how much damage this could have actually but done I, I think that i think that he is so joyous in how evil he's being oh yeah and how much he wants to torture her that you buy in that like yeah it's i'm not overboard i am on board and that his four boys like just with a little bit of coaching already know how to like work this like he's raising a few little con artists in, in a way but they all believe that this is owed to them and and you're you're with them there's no uncomfortable like kid not wanting to go along or something like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. She, he brings her to their home. She's like, we chose to move here. <laughs> yeah. But the, this house is a pigsty and it's small and it slants downward <laughs> and there's a turtle and these kids are little pieces of shit. And the smallest one is talking like Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> and Goldie Hawn is like, we have a falsetto child. <laughs> Two of the kids are tr- <laughs> like, that's a type of child. <laughs> Two of the kids are twins. Um, Not identical, obviously. Yeah. And he's like, you'll get your memory back if you just go about your daily routine. And here's your daily routine. You're tortured all day. All right. And it, I mean, I know it's supposed to be funny. The way they treat food in this movie is, is upsetting to me. But I mean, because there's just always a bottle of Hershey syrup being used inappropriately, meaning like someone's just drinking it or like sticking it in a turtle. I don't know. Like, ugh. And she's got, I don't know, a goose. I don't know what this is. But this is fine. But that's a goose. But this is clearly not the way you, you're just shoving in a deep, who defeathered it? All right. Well, but she's shoving in the pot with carrots and, and potatoes and I never feel, feel like I've never done this a day in my life and she just half she's starting to go into like a kind of a catatonic state and then she kind of stays there for a few days just just totally t- t- <laughs> I don't know well, it's believable she he, looks very unbelieving of what she's being told is yeah, real she has no muscle memory for how to cook but she's being told no 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 you cook all the time she's like oh, okay I guess I do then uh, but she doesn't know how to light the stove and Carlos is like um honey you're gonna light the burner it's just a and he's just dick right there just taking delight in, in just dunking on this woman and, and then she um, burns herself but th- there is this, I mean, there's this idea of like, he's a stereotypical dad. Mom's jobs, m- the mom's job is to keep the house and raise the kids and keep everything in order. And it's the dad's job. If the dad were left to his own devices, they'd be chugging chocolate syrup and right. uh, and eating fr- cans of frosting and never going to school. And dad's there to joke around and keep things sleazy. And mom's there to bring it ra- back in. Um then she has a she's well then he tells her that you know she lays on the she sleeps on the sofa because the bad back and everything and then because this and then the dogs jump on her and her body and then it starts raining and there's just i mean it's it's a, a lot of rain that's falling on her so she's having a dream that she's at a new year's eve party and she's wealthy and beautiful and but the confetti it's getting into her eyelashes in a very funny way and, and aggravating her and she wakes up to rain on her face because 
I think the visual humor in this movie is really uh, is really effective. Yeah. Um, I like that it starts to rain and we don't see her go get the pots. It just edits forward and now she's sleeping with pots mm-hmm. laying on top of her. And I like the uh, dream sequence with the confetti, the way it's staged and the way that uh, her character in the dream suddenly seems to notice this is a lot of confetti. Right. Or just that it seems to be annoyed. She's becoming annoyed. It's less enchanting what she's doing. Plus the man she's dancing with is not her husband. Looks nothing like him, but it looks faintly like Kurt Russell. Same hair, but we never mm. see his face intentionally. So it's like she's she's dreaming of dancing with someone she thinks she's supposed to be dancing of d- dancing with, but but we don't see the face and she doesn't seem to notice his face either because that might give it away. Earlier, he um, after dinner, he's like, well, it's that time of the evening where I then go I go out and I carouse and get drunk with my friends, which sounds right to me. Uh, That's what my dad did. <laughs> is the idea that he actually d- did this with his old wife or he is just trying to torture her? Well, he's definitely just trying to torture her. He's also trying to get some free babysitting out of the deal and he's got to come up with the rest of his plan. He also ends up getting a second job later. I, I think he just needs the time. And he yeah, he needs he doesn't want to spend a lot of time with her. He goes off to the bowling alley with his friend and he, I mean, and then he explains, and I think this is necessary. He's like, well, I figure she owes me $600. I value her labor at $25 a day. So in X number of days, then I'll let her go. And he's like, oh, okay. And then he pours the whiskey on himself. And he's like, I'm going to put a real scare in her by pretending I'm going to fuck her. But I'm not going to. So that happens. No, oh, and no also, boom, boom. That was my second question. Does he actually call sex boom, boom? Or is he just trying to weird her out? He's trying to weird her out. It never comes up again. Okay. Okay. All right. Then she has another full day of cleaning and you watch her d- d- figure out how to do laundry. The washing machine attacks her. She tries to use a chainsaw for some fucking reason. That goes bad. She's having a rough time, but she sure is trying to do a lot. Like, it's interesting how much she's, he's giving her a list of things she usually does and fuck if she's not going to try and do them all. It's interesting. The kids come home from school and she's just been sitting there in a catatonic state and they're kind of throwing food at her and stuff. But i I remember kids being a little bit more hellish. They're actually sweet faster than I, they're sweet. They're mm-hmm. normal. The pacings. I, I think that they're nice when they're supposed to be nice. They're uh, suspicious when they're supposed to be suspicious. And I don't know. It works for me. The kids work. Um, and then Kurt Russell gets home and he's like, what the hell did you guys do? And they explain I don't know, Kurt says something about her needing to do another thing, and then that's when she starts going, and so he picks her up, and he throws her in a water barrel. And she comes up out of the water barrel, and she like looks kind of nonplussed. Right, she's like, well, that happened. And she's like, my life is hell, my children are spawn of the devil. Uh and this is, there is kind of a private Benjamin-esque arc to this of like, she is really flailing about. This is not a woman up to the challenge, but maybe she will rise to it, but not quite yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but she really has accepted it, except for now she's kind of getting a little more logical about it because she's had time to look around the house and um, and she finds it weird that there's nothing of hers no pictures, no photos that, I don't know, it is strange. Why wouldn't there be some photographic proof of your life together? So I was wondering why Billy Pratt is a photographer and why they bother showing you that on the on his trailer in the very beginning. And um, and then, okay, photographer actually guess means in this that he's like pre-Photoshop, I'm going to, I'm going to fake some photos for you because... Kurt Russell gathers as another thing. I was like, why are there so many photos of her in the hospital? They take, they take the like four or five photos of Uh her in different (laughs) confusion faces. And he takes that folder home comes in handy though. um, Because now he was able to fake a few wedding photos and whatnot. And And she looks at him. She's like, okay, I, I guess I always think because this kind of technology did not really exist. You could really fake some shit back then. So I was always miserable. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's this, uh, and and there's like the thread that pops up here that you think is going to continue in the movie more where she gets these flashes of her actual life. She's like, wait a minute, the closet, the closet, the boat. Oh no. But it it like doesn't go anywhere. Right. You're like, you remembered we used to, we used to do it in the closet. And just when you're sick of him saying shit like that, she stands in for us and she's like, don't talk about sex again. And it's just, yeah. they, they balance it. Cause a little bit of too much of either of what they're doing 
is going to be aggravating to the audience. And they did they just know when to call the other person an idiot? She's she's like she's really sort of spiraling and uh, uh, about the fact that this this very much does not seem like I belong in this life. And now I have some photos that I guess prove that I do belong. I don't know what to think. And he's like, you need to just go take a bath and start over again tomorrow. OK. And this movie has a lot of really bad ADR. And I uh, wait, wait, the photos happen the day after she takes the bath, just so you know that. Okay. Um, this movie has a lot of a lot of ADR. And I know it's hacked to point out bad ADR, but listen to this. Listen you to already this. made me watch it twice when we See, were watching it. now you're getting grumpy, and it's because you've been busy. I want you to stop everything. Go on in here. Take a bath. Hey, guys, get the turtle out of the bathtub. <laughs> it's and I, I'm going to look for the pictures first thing. I just, I'm, what the hell happened I, there? I, I can tell by his body language. It's just that he says, get the fucking turtle out the bathtub. You think so? I really do. I don't think they're just like, we don't have a fuck anywhere else in the movie. Let's take it away. We already had her ass crack later, earlier. No, you keep saying that but i'm saying like i think you can get away with a lot of stuff but the f word is different you can have one fuck but you can't have the ass crack you can't get both so they chose the ass crack well the ass crack is is pivotal to the fucking plot they keep it is it is very crucial we keep coming back to the yacht and edward herman is partying with some sexy ladies i like when people party just by dancing with sexy ladies (laughs) it's just like a beer commercial every time we cut to them but they stand on furniture matt that's how you know it's wild and they usually have like something on their head that is not a hat. It's like pants or a tie. That's how you know things That's are getting how you really know. silly. Topsy turvy dress time. But uh, yeah, Goldie Hawn. Maybe maybe the the ice is starting to thaw because she's starting to get the groove of this family. She's giving Kurt Russell a disgusting foot rub, and then the kids play a prank on her where they glue her hands to plates. Glue in movies is always way stronger than glue in real life, but. You know, hey, I don't have the use of my hands anymore. I just have these plates for hands. I'll get you back. She brings the hose into the house and sprays them all with the hose. I do enjoy. And for the first time, she smiles. I like that the thing that causes her to start to uh, warm up to this family is I'll just be shitty too. Right. Well, and the whole time she's doing it so that they know she's play. She's she's trying to play their way. She's doing this. Like she's being, she thinks they're being childish and she's like well then can't beat them join them and then and then she runs away you know like oh my god they're gonna get me and then they tickle each other i fucking love that Mm -hmm. and i love that it's just the kids doing it you know the adults are like cleaning up or whatever the fuck they're doing it is dumb she sprayed her own bed but whatever what do they call it with with a kid when you're supposed to to mimic their play like you You get on the kids level you mirror that's it you mirror you you do Play with them the way they want to be played with. That's what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Good momming. Yeah. Um, and then there's a scene at school where the four boys who are apparently all in the same class. No, it was a placement class. I thought the same thing. No, they're being placed. That they're all supposed to take a test that helps them figure out where they need to go in that school. Oh, because there's a thing where they just moved to this town. Exactly. Or something. It's but, there for, yeah. But they also seem like they have deep ties because... They have this best friend. Yeah, well, they just moved to that town because of that best friend, so they can help him kind of get on his feet. All right. Well, th- this teacher's like, you all need... That's to- the principal! This is the principal. Okay. Yes. The principal says, you all need... Lacey's so mad. <laughs> uh, in a non-justified way, I think. But then again, she's not a sweet woman. Are we talking about the principal or me? The principal <laughs> is mad that these kids are not like cooperating with taking their placement test. Plus, they're all very itchy. Stop scratching yourselves they think they're she thinks they're playing sick but she has preconceived notions of these children because she showed up unannounced to their fucking house that's weird yeah and she's like there's no mom in this house clearly this is fucked up and you know like this could have really gone south because like she's the only person that's in not in on the ruse but knows that his wife died three years ago and that could have just been game over i mean a different movie would have I thought it was going to something. be that because they said, we got a new mom. Right. But she never says to when Goldie Hawn comes in, oh, so you're the new mother. Right. She's it just, just like, it could oh, have been... Mrs. Prophet. Right. Exactly. So they call Goldie Hawn in. And I like that now Goldie Hawn, her, her, um, her, her, debutante, her dormant Karenness comes out because she starts to berate the principal for not taking her kids. Uh, She's being an advocate, Matt. Itchiness okay. seriously. Uh, like, this is what I know. I know how to yell at people. Uh, for not doing their jobs well. So she does. But now on behalf, now for the right reasons, now on behalf of her kids who have poison oak. Is poison oak the same as poison ivy? No. All right. It's a different fucking plant. One's so, a tree. Uh, and, and they're like, well, dad never did that. 
and importantly, he's outside of the teacher uh, of he can hear everything happening. The dad can. So like they both get sold on An- they all of them start liking Annie more. Yeah, she realizes that the youngest kid can't read, can't read, whether it's dyslexia or whatever. I'm going to give him the attention he deserves. And now she feels I'm I'm really pulling my weight. And I notice my husband is not. He's just an overgrown child. And she says, I want to have a conversation about that. And he's like, whoa, man. This is the first time he's really having a hard time with his own uh, charade. Because now she's going into territory that normally would not make sense for her to be talking about. And he's, I get it. The the amount of he's able to like keep continue the the lie is always impressive to me because they get heated a lot and it's like I would fuck this up so fast. Yeah, yeah, it'll be like uh, and uh, I made a decision a long time ago. I mean, we made the decision right. a long time ago, and she keeps saying, I mean, she, repeatedly, it's like, but you always like this, and she has the very even if she weren't a brainwashed amnesiac, uh, a case that any of us can make is it's no longer okay with me. Right, right. Right. I, I have my mind now. Like, I, I don't feel completely in the clouds anymore. So now that this is the new me, let's let's get to know her. Or like plenty of couples are like, we're young together once and then one right. of them exactly. kind of matures and the other doesn't. And it's like, man, you used to be so easygoing. I'm not right. anymore. So we have to figure this out. Right. And I really like Goldie Hawn. I think this is her best dramatic acting in the movie mm-hmm. um you know when he he says like and it's none of your business and she's like none my of children. my business my children right? none of my business um it's 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 really effective yeah uh, and again her voice she's starting to sound more and more like sort of a goldie hawn-esque mm-hmm. figure um yeah uh, kurt russell and his friend are planning a mini golf course that's how they'll make money well i mean they're yeah they're preparing for an actual uh, in a meeting but that's not what's happening right here um he is just saying he's got to go meet the guys gotta go meet the guys it makes it sound like he's trying to go bowling so she's getting really aggravated like no we you could skip this one night thing you do this every night she doesn't know that what he's actually doing is working a nighttime job and he goes off and he does that goes and right yes he he goes off And she tells the, and she goes to the boys and they're like, let me guess, dad's not going to eat dinner with us. And she's like, he had to go bowling. And the other kid's like, how do you go bowling without a bowling ball? And there's the bowling ball. And so she goes to the bowling alley looking for him. But that's when she sees him at a manure plant and she, to not embarrass him so that he can keep his dignity, she just goes back home, but she feels better about it. Yeah. Assumed he was cheating on her or whatever. But actually, yeah, he's, he, he kind of is pulling his weight, isn't he? What a guy. This is also the moment when um, we see the triumphant freezer is no longer frozen. It has been defrosted. So important to point that out. Okay, so he gets home from his hard labor job and he's feeling bad about the fight that they had, but he really all clicks into place with him. It's kind of the first time he's stopped to look around at how much better his life is. The refrigerator is completely stocked. The house is completely neat and it all things are just feeling like home again and he's been taking her completely for granted so he goes over to the sofa to try to apologize but also to say thank you and that's when she will not show her face and i think it's very cute that she's like don't look at me i'm ugly and he's and he's like you're not ugly we you think you're pretty and then she's got poison oak all over and it's all cute because he's like we normally think you're very good looking just not right now (laughs) just not now and he picks her up and she says i don't want to go to the water barrel again and he says no no and then he puts her in the bed and that's really sweet i love that that moment of them are they were now nice to each other and she says tell me something about my past something nice and he's like well you worked at the burger palace and a child was choking and you saved the child's life and you were burger palace employee of the month and she's like oh she feels really good about herself yes and he's he very specifically says how proud he was of her it's not about her looks it's not about it's not about the stuff she's been praised for her whole life there's something like really deep inside her that knows that she needs to be felt she's she did something important to somebody and someone's proud of her for Praise it. for something she did. Yeah. For, for something that she's and, good at. And something she did to some, for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and an accomplishment. You were Burger Palace employee of the And month. I wasn't jealous. <laughs> I was proud of you. I mean it. Yeah. You know, she's definitely in, in a rich, in a rich society. <laughs> I don't know. And I can imagine it's very competitive. That you're always in, competing with your friends and don't really know who your friends are. I just think there's a lot to that story. They are um, 
He takes her out for a night on the town. Oh, a little it's date her night. birthday. It's her birthday. Oh, yeah, because he's about to like confess he's to her. He's about to finally, he's like, it's gone too far. I really like her now. I need to tell her. But instead, he's like, um, what did you need to tell me, honey? I uh, I forgot your birthday. It's your birthday right now. Happy birthday. It's my birthday. They take they go on a little date night. She dances wild as fuck. She's not ready to go home. They drink some champagne and um you know, they finally kiss for the first time in the movie. Well, they tell the Katarina and the Antoro story. These uh fucking People who the, went out to sea and the to. sea foam represents their love. No, it's, just, it's, it's an explanation as to why boats honk three times and it's this love story. So it matters later that Katarina and Antoro. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's a lovely moment. They finally kiss. She says, Dean. He says, yes. What is she going to ask? What she asks is, how old am I? Mm-hmm. He's like 29. Which is the sweetest answer any man could say, except for like, why were you 14 having a kid? But, you know, it happens. She's actually 43 at the time of filming. And then they go home and they finally make boom, boom. Uh, <laughs> um, totally, totally OK. The next morning, the the boys come into the room to surprise her with her birthday present. And Goldie Hawn's naked under the sheets. You can hear the little boners popping out. Ew. We got you that. a new dryer. It's a washing machine. Washing machine. And then they Yay. walk away. And in voiceover, we hear one of the kids say, she doesn't have any tits, but her ass is nice. And then and then you hear Goldie Hawn say, what are you saying? What did her There's got to be so many things that click into place for her after she realizes oh, what's happened. That's why they had little boners. Oh, my God. The looming threat of Annie's mom. It's been lurking in the background. She keeps calling her son-in-law like, where is my daughter? He's like, oh, you just missed her. She jumped in the ocean. Okay. Call back next week. So, but she's going to force the issue. She's like, he better, she better be on the phone next week or I'm coming to, I don't know, kill you. So he's like, okay, we got to go back to Oregon. He says, Oregon. Okay. And um, meanwhile, back in Oregon, Don Goldie Hawn finds these panties in Kurt Russell's truck. She's like, who do these belong to? Well, they're actually her panties from her pre amnesiac life. And he's like, all right, the jig is up. I'm going to tell you. Okay, you're not really my wife. I just met you recently, but she doesn't believe him. And then meanwhile, his friend Billy's like, oh, actually, those are my panties from my girlfriend. And then the kids are also like, dad, you are not going to tell her the truth. We want her. And he's like, no, I need to tell her the truth. And he's like, they're like, but you said we shouldn't lie. And he's like, I lied. I had my reasons. And they're like, we have our reasons, too. Which I think is nice. Mm -hmm. I like that line. Yeah, your parents, they're not always right. No, I just mean that you might think your issue is really important, but that I could have just as important of a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm a kid. And there's four of us. We outvote you. Okay, whatever. Whatever you. No, whatever you. The um, jig is up. Okay. Well, the the putt-putt is a, a grand success. They get to go experience that and have a wonderful day. They really do have a great day. She's wearing the macaroni necklace that one of the kids made her. It's the only jewelry she has. Dean gives her a wedding ring that he bought that because she said she must have lost it in the ocean. And I mean, like, and like they're riding back home in their shit you not Sanford and Son style truck. And she's laying on his shoulder. The kids are laying on her. Like, it's just so fucking sweet. They have a quaint, perfect life. You don't need all the opulence. You don't even need middle class anything. And then here comes fucking Grant. And um, and she she gets out of the truck. Everyone else is very the boys are and the and and Dean are all like, what the fuck is this? They I guess they they know what the hell's going on. And she's just kind of like la 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 la. And she walks by her ex her husband and she says, Hi, Grant, and then walks into the house and then slowly emerges and is like, Hi, Grant. It takes her a while to realize this this isn't a big happy moment. She's very excited to have regained all of her memories at once. And she's so happy that she's kissing Dean. And thank you yeah. for giving me this gift. <laughs> I like takes, that. I like that. Because, yeah. yeah, it hasn't caught. Logic hasn't caught up. She's like, right. oh, my husband's back. And now I remember everything. Oh, I'm rich. Great. And I, this guy I love and these kids I love. Right. Wait a minute. What? The Why f- do I love them? What did you do to me? What did you tell me? Oh, God, you tricked me. She says you used me. Right. It does not. It doesn't, and I thought it, it it happened faster than this, but it does not occur to her, why is Grant now coming? Why didn't Grant look at the city we were parked at for so long But when I went missing? Mm-hmm. Um, she knows she was on the news. That's her new memories. She knows that happened. It's why gotta didn't be, Grant? Because it's got to be the final straw that makes right, her leave right. him. 
but she uh yeah tearfully leaves this house i guess kurt russell's like kids i'm gonna be going away to federal prison for the rest of my life so get ready well uh, the kids chase the limo and it's like you know she's holding back tears like she instantly regret she it's a loss um yeah, and then the little one's like you said moms don't leave yeah mm. it, it is like there's you could make a sci-fi version of this about robots. And in fact, Westworld kind of did. Like okay. with uh, the robot played by um, Tendiway Newton. Mm-hmm. Um, Who has a, the memory of a dead daughter. Of a child from a previous iteration. is like, no, oh. that girl doesn't exist anymore. She was never actually your daughter. It's like, yeah, but I still am programmed to love her. I've got it in me. What am I supposed to do with that? Right. I love these kids and I know that it's fucked up. I thought I was their, their mom. mom. Right. But like, but that is... I do. I did for two months think I was their mom. Yeah. So now, what do I do with that? Right. And I, I had completely forgot how this wraps up. This is brilliant. I was thinking she just returns to an opulent life, and she's like, "What's the point? She doesn't. She just doesn't see. It's not charming anymore. Remember, she's nice to the staff. I remember that, and that she ends up leaving. I completely forgot that they bring the sh- they bring the psychoanalyst on board. Her mom's there. All I mean, the stuff they 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 think something is wrong with her. They're like there to fix her, to change her back to the old Joanne. So like, she's not even good enough for where she's she's not accepted by them. Like because of every. Above all else, she's not allowed to be an embarrassment. That is that is the main thing her mom cannot allow. That's why she's so dialed in. Not because she loves her, but because she needs to make sure she's keeping up appearances. So for her to be this, she needs and, to and, snap her back. But the, this, the way she's acting is not that like, hey, you've been through a traumatic ordeal. Understandable that you'd be a little off. But we wanted you to be your bubbly self uh and and refined and not asking to drink beer fine but like she can't go back to her high they have to do all this on the boat she can't go back to her high society new york life and then say for two months my daughter thought she was this she was completely um conned into being the wife and basic servant of this blue collar guy she like the real truth of what happened to joanne cannot be known Mm -hmm. she has to come back herself and Mm -hmm. all of this was just a big long trip at sea so yeah they're on a time schedule that's a good point get to your other self you looking around and asking if you can be of help or even just being nice all of this is fucked I love this doctor character. <laughs> it's just a two it's scene when thing. I wrote this <laughs> so he's so okay. His Doctor Corman is his name. I don't know who plays him. Sorry, but he's like he's sitting at their grand piano and he's like giving his medical diagnosis as he right. strokes the ivories. It's fine. And he's like, it's it's remarkable. Her memory is fully intact. She remembers so much. She even remembers when I wrote this. <laughs> and they're like, Doctor, please, please. It's like, oh, okay. My, my, my. Um. But yeah, she comes in. She wants to drink a beer instead of champagne. She's like, sees her mom. And she's like, mom, would you like some cheese? And just walks two feet holding a platter. And they're like, oh, oh. And like, you want to smoke, don't you? And she says, do, do I smoke? Oh, yeah, you always smoke. That's so wild. It's, it's like, a- well, okay, if she's an actual smoker, she'd have been like shivering this whole movie. Oh, if she didn't. Well, but all that happened in the hospital too, right? Like, I mean, she could have gotten past that. We don't mm. know how long she was in the hospital. Um. Uh, yeah, but she's just kind of, she's, it's funny. She recaptures that dazed look like she, that, that, you know, hundred yard stare, whatever you call that, like the same as she is the first couple of days at Dean's house. She's just like, what the fuck am I? What is any of this? Then she does not sleep in the bed with her husband and, and there's no like to do about that. I like that. Like, like there's no, it's not, it's not part of it. It's just like she, they just show her go and lay in bed with her mom and you're like, okay, yeah, she's feeling some distance romantically from her husband right now. That makes sense. And then she gets up and she's just like, nope, shots with the steerage folk. And I love that. Well, she, yeah, she's, she goes and ha- and takes some shots with the help. She's, and they're like, well, she's talking to us, but she's kind of cool now. She knows how to drink. Drink. Shots of, of liquor mm-hmm. and then she finally has a conversation with roddy mcdowell and she apologizes to him for treating him so badly for all these years he looks like he's gonna have a heart attack at hearing these words but then he, he has a nice line he's like madam you have the rare privilege of i'm not gonna do it thank you of uh experiencing a different station in life than what you were born into 
now you know. And the question is, what are you going to do what with this it? knowledge? What are you do with the so she seizes control of the boat and heads back to Oregon. Right. And she turns so fast that she shoots an old lady out of the bed, which <laughs> never stops being funny to me. And, <laughs> and the fucking dog. No, the dog stays, I think. Back on land, Kurt Russell and his, he's like, you know what? Damn it, we're going to go get her back. He, he and his friends have commandeered a Coast Guard no, vessel. No, it finally makes sense why they've said it four times now that Billy Pratt used to be in the Coast Guard. Hey, you're this a is, photographer in a golf club, right. man, but also you're a Coast Guard mariner. This yep. is perfect. So, yeah. So you were then. three characters in the script, but we only had the budget for one actor. So, um, yeah, he, they, 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 they basically chase her down. She, Edward Herman's like, no, uh, you're not, you're not leaving. I'm the captain of this vessel. Because well, she's the money. The money is hers. He can't let her go, or he will. But we not... don't know that yet. It's only the final reveal of the movie. No, we know that before then. We do. Yeah, I don't remember when, but um, she's like, I'm rich. I'm terribly rich. I don't, I don't know. I just remember. I don't, I don't remember that being a big reveal to me. Hmm. I mean, look at her mom. I, Okay. They're all rich fucks. He's going to be fine too. But he, he, uh, uh, yeah, the two boats are on a collision course. They need to, they need to get her off that boat onto this boat. But Edward Herman's not going to let it happen. But he let slip that he saw her in the hospital and then abandoned her. And it is truly the the worst thing that anybody does in this movie is what he did to her in that moment. Uh, you know what? Maybe the two months of uh, gaslighting and 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 uh, abuse and brainwashing was worse. But just in terms of a singular act, I'd say that was the worst thing. Right. The boats get near each other. Goldie jumps into the water. Kurt jumps into the water. They're reunited. Uh, and he's like, "You're. I'll never let you go again. You're my Annie and you always will be. I own you. You're my property. Oh my God, Matt. Why do you have to take such a sweet moment and make it bad? It's just weird. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's weird nice. for him. It's nice because she doesn't want to be called Joanna anymore. And I think that that is a little counter to what the movie's mm. theme is. Is Now he's saying, no, you're my Annie and you always will be. The point is you got to choose. Plus, it's the Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell thing. Got to choose every day to be with each other. Fine. Let it be bad. It's a little no, nit. He, all right. So here's where I get a, like an um, existential crisis is, is when she announces, you know, when she says that the money is hers. And it's a little time has passed and they're still on the boat on the way home. And, um, and all the boys are writing down and she, and he explains they're already, they're writing their Christmas list. And one of them says, how do you spell Porsche? And it's just like, oh, they're going to fucking suck. Yeah. They are going to, I, I, ooh, I don't even want them in like a middle-class neighborhood. They're just, they're, the discontent. I don't understand their dynamic if they aren't like getting by together. No, they're going to be terrible. It's yes, so they're going to fucked. They're going to they're they're going to start a super pack with the Koch brothers. Okay. Yeah, they're going to destroy the world. No, he's not going to fit into her society. She's not going to fit into her own anymore. But she's not doesn't totally relate to where the fuck is it that they are. They don't have to work, but they're working class. Those kids don't want to go to private school. Like what the fuck? Are they staying in Elts now? They're gonna learn. Are they gonna to be, be the mayor of Elts? No, Elts they're now? gonna learn, and they're gonna be they're gonna be a certain type of rich. They're gonna be new money. Uh, but she's going to be teaching them all the way. Now, no, no, don't sip, don't slurp. And but that's what it is to be rich. I mean, the the she rich people in this movie, the Goldie Hawn and her mother, like rich people like that, they're like, we're not rich. Those fucks in Europe who have l- literal titles, they're the real rich people. We're just pretending. We could never, that's the point of being rich is you can always point to other rich people and say they're the ones who are actually in control. They're the ones who actually have money. Yeah. And so when this family gets money, and they have to learn how to cosplay as real rich well, people. That's just the name of the game. Philanthropy. Maybe they'll stay humble. Let's just pretend that happens. Sure. And Fucking Porsche. Goldie Hawn says, you can give me something, a daughter. And it is, I guess, the payoff to the earlier thing where she apparently did want to have a baby, but her mom said, you can't have a baby because you're a baby. I think she also realized she didn't want to have a baby in, with him mm-hmm. or in that environment. Like what she'd be so miserable. But yeah. A little girl. This is not the ideal way to start a relationship. Ideal, no. Quite but the story. The heart wants what it wants, though, yeah. you know? Like like a movie we love, Licorice Pizza. Maybe a 15-year-old boy should not be in, in a relationship with a 25-year-old woman. But, you know, they work it. They get there. <laughs> they make it work somehow. They get it there, you yeah. know? Lacey, what are you? What are you thinking? Shoot, dang! I hadn't even thought about it. I feel like a four is too high for a movie like this, but I really liked it. What do you I, mean? Well, 
I don't. I feel like four has to be reserved for like prestige cinema. But like, no. I feel like this movie gets everything right. I I would watch it again right now. And and you know, rewatchability is important to me. And I just feel like there's so much balance, such good tone, good pacing, good editing, good good performances that those actors themselves were response that you couldn't just do two other actors and get the same thing. And I really respect that. So I'm going to say a four. How successful is a movie at doing what it's trying to do is like, is how I think of it. That's right. But is it trying to do enough? Well, what does it mean to be enough? It's trying to be a, it's trying to be a sweet comedy. It did it. Yeah. It's sweet on me. And of, of sweet comedies, I wouldn't say it's one of the best ever, but I liked it a lot. Three and a half stars. Yeah, I knew you were going to get it. It's very that. funny and uh, very well directed. I think it has a real flair for visual comedy. I think the editing is really good. And you can't beat these two performances. And again, what a fucking upset that these kids, I like them. Also, Edward Herman and Roddy McDowell, very funny. The mom, very yeah. funny. Dr. Corman, the MVP of the movie. Also very funny. Billy Pratt, very likable. Uh, yeah, there's not any... Uh, Yep, you did it, Goldie Hawn. You've won me over. You've you've thawed my cold heart, like you when you were brainwashed into being their mother. Yep. So, what are we doing next week, Lacey? Next week is something called X Two. That's right, X Men United. Yes, from two thousand three, the follow up to previous episode X Men. Uh, okay. Directed by Brian Singer, we will detail why Brian Singer is a piece of shit and is rightfully canceled. But if we're on the second movie of one we've already featured, is it fair to say you're running out of fucking movies? My is it man? Fair? That was in 2017, and we talked about it for probably 11 minutes. Sounds <laughs> like I like we did Father the Bride two. We started with two. Just feels like cheating us all. What the fuck? I'm kidding. I'm sure you've got interesting things to say about this movie we already talked about. Oh, thanks. No, we did not talk about this movie. <laughs> this is a superior movie to X-Men okay. 1. Okay. You're going to have to watch X-Men 1 also. I knew you were going to do that. Sorry to make you have to be informed about the things you talk about. <sighs> but there's an X-Men series on Disney Plus, a cartoon, an animated series that... People like it. I hate to praise Disney, but it, it's really great. The yeah. series. So, What's it called? X Men ninety seven. Yeah, I've heard people. The talk idea about it. is there was a really popular X Men animated series in the nineties that ended in nineteen ninety seven, and this series is like we're just picking right up where oh, that that's one left cool. off. They brought back a lot of the original voice talent, some of the original producers, um, so it does have at least some integrity in that. But I like it a lot. Anyway, I've got X Men on the brain. People like when we talk about big movies. Yeah, they I've do. been looking at the stats and yeah, noticing they do. that. So that's what we're talking about. X two, X Men United. Uh, hey, everybody, please do give us five stars on Apple, iTunes, and Spotify. If you please subscribe, if you haven't already, we put every episode, uh, on YouTube as well. Watch it there, like it there, subscribe to it there, etc., etc. Load bearing beams pod is where you can find us. If you want someone to interact with you from this podcast, if you go on TikTok, just touch it, touch it with your little fingies and say hi to me. I will say hi back. I am very interactive. Matt is on the other platforms, but not very interactive. Getting a little more every here and there. I interact there. with everybody who says anything. Shut to me. your damn mouth. Okay, so oh if you want to form like a real relationship, you just come see me on TikTok. <laughs> little dot bring to beeps. I'm on Twitter at my, I'm personally on Twitter at Matt Stokes Nine. The show is Load Bearing Beans Pod. Reach me either of those places. I will interact. I don't know what she's talking about. To a lesser degree. We're also on Instagram at Load Bearing Beans, and um, I'm on Letterbox at Matt Stokes Nine. And I'm on Letterbox at Letterbox Lazy. No, Load Bearing Lacy. I'll get that one take. I, I'm two movies behind them, and it's making me very. I it's just one more place. It's one more wanna, place. I didn't want to nag you about it, but I was like, uh, I'm looking for your Planet of the Apes I you. know. I'm looking for it, too. Can you do it? The music on the show is by my band, Rural Route 9. That's R-U-R-A-L space R-O-U-T-E space N-I-N-E. Rural Route 9. Are you Route writing Nine. that down? We have an album called The Joy of Averages. You'll recognize the music if you listen to Load Bearing Beams. Uh, listen to it on Spotify and all the other places. Thank you very much. Okay, I love you. Bye. Three, four.
Go! <laughs> <laughs>